So what we've heard is General Phillips contend that the main argument the government has posed for keeping the MEK on the list is illogical. We've heard the former Attorney General talk about how the main reason for keeping the MEK on the list is illegal. Now we're going to hear from Alan Dershowitz about how keeping them on the list has grave moral implications on human rights because of how you stigmatize and stereotype someone when you call them a terrorist. It makes it all right for someone to kill them with impunity. And that is a moral issue, and here to talk about it is Alan Dershowitz. Thank you. Thank you. I, too, can never ever come to the Senate building without my mind going back to the great Senator Kennedy, perhaps the greatest senator ever to serve in this building in terms of human rights and so many other things that we care deeply about. One of the great privileges of my own personal life was to work closely with the senator on the widest variety of human rights issues. And I would venture to say that if he were alive today, not only would he be so thrilled that his son is carrying on his work, he would be in this room today advocating for us. Iran is the most interesting place in the world today in many ways. It is the most dangerous country in the world, but it also is a country with the greatest promise in the world. Imagine the peace dividend if Iran were to have true democratic leadership today. It could become a model in the Middle East, a model for the Muslim world. It could bring about not only formalistic democracy, which we're seeing in some parts of the Middle East, but real democracy, democracy that values equality for women, democracy that values the right of free speech, the right of dissent. The other thing about Iran that I think many underestimate, both in this country and in other parts of the Middle East, is even the current leadership. This is a debate. Are they rational or are they irrational? Are they rational for doing some of the things they're doing? Nobody can explain uh, killing gays, uh, uh, putting people in jail and torturing them as rational. But they are shrewd. They understand how to manipulate public opinion. They understand how to use various international fora for delay. They understand how to widen the differences between America and some of its allies about what the appropriate point of no return is in developing nuclear weapons. No one should ever, ever underestimate the shrewdness of the Iranian regime. Shrewdness combined with evil purpose poses the greatest danger that the world faces. And shrewdness combined with evil purpose with a nuclear weapon, nothing could be more dangerous. And I know that many of you here today are proud of the fact that some of the information that the world has obtained about Iran's nuclear potential comes from colleagues and friends within Iran. But I'm not here today to speak on behalf of any group or any political party. I'm here today to speak as an American who cares deeply about our Constitution, who cares deeply about our promises and our commitments. I'm here to speak today on behalf of our constitutional right to petition government for a redress of grievances, to petition government to keep its promises, to allow us full and complete free speech. We here today disagree with the government's policy when it comes to Camp Ashraf, when it comes to listing the MEK, and we have a complete right, a greater right than the government itself. As Jefferson once said, given a choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, he would not hesitate to pick the latter. Our right of free speech is even more important than the government's power. 
And the government is trying to take that away from us. They're trying to threaten those of us who disagree with their policy. As the Supreme Court said in its most recent First Amendment case, if the First Amendment has any force, it prohibits Congress from fining or jailing citizens or associations of citizens for simply engaging in political speech. We are here engaging in political speech and we are being threatened by our government for doing the right thing, for speaking up on behalf of human rights. How dare the government try to repress the truth? And they are trying to repress it in more ways than one, as we've heard today. And I was just shocked listening to the general describe in detail. It just shocked me. I teach legal ethics at Harvard Law School. I've been teaching legal ethics for a quarter of a century. And the idea that the government of the United States would stand before a court and misrepresent facts, and then, when they're called on it, write a letter to the court. You know, you can often understand a lawyer in the heat of combat answering a question that he was not prepared for and overstating it or making a mistake. I can excuse that. I can understand that. But then when the lawyers write a letter and say, now you have a chance to correct the record, here's the response of the United States government. With respect to you and your clients, you have a particular view of the facts, but we disagree with that view. The government stands by the statements made by the attorney on behalf of the Secretary of State in the D.C. Circuit on May 8th. Stands by those statements. Would I love to be a fly on the wall if General Phillips and other generals who were there sat opposite Hillary Clinton on whose behalf these statements were being made and were able to listen to the specific factual allegations, show the photographs, and ask Senator, sorry, Secretary Clinton whether or not these views represent her views, I suspect the answer would be no, and we'd be getting a very quick apology from the United States government. But we're not getting an apology. The government is standing by its erroneous statements. I've been practicing law for 48 years. I've opposed the government in many, many cases. I have never personally experienced a misrepresentation of this kind by a government lawyer like the one presented to the United States Court of Appeals. For shame, for shame. And I think that General McKay was right not mentioning the name of the lawyer. It's not that lawyer. That lawyer may have made a mistake. It's the United States government that wrote the letter reaffirming the statement of the lawyer. Yes, they have some nuanced responses that maybe this investigation didn't occur, that investigation didn't occur. That's a half-truth at best. What we heard today from the general was the complete truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, what we are pledged to present to the court. So we have a real problem here today. We have a problem of timing. Justice delayed is justice denied. And when justice delayed may cause the taking of human lives, it's more serious than just the theory of justice denied. We have every reason to believe and hope that the State Department will do the right thing and ultimately comes to the decision to delist the MEK. Okay, they say they'll do it 60 days after everybody has left the camp, after they have a chance to inspect to see if there are weapons behind. There may well be weapons behind. Of course, the Iraqis could easily plant weapons when everybody's out of the camp. Right. What they have to do is now investigate. I was informed this morning that not a single government has yet agreed to accept a single person from Camp Ashraf to move into their country. And I'm told when we speak sometimes to officials of the government, that's not because of the listing that involves other factors. I don't believe that. I believe that when governments are asked by the United States to accept people as political refugees, and out of one side of their mouth, they say, accept them. Out of the other side of their mouth, they say, but they're terrorists. They are speaking hypocrisy. You can't speak that kind of double speak. The United States has to speak with one voice. 
And that voice has to be clear. We have done all the investigations. We have done all the inspections. We can certify to you that if you accept these people, they are not only not terrorists, they're going to do for you what the Iranian immigrants to the United States have done to America. Raise the educational level. Raise the economic level. There have been very few more successful immigrant groups to the United States of America than groups from Iran, many of them represented by people in this audience. Every country should be thrilled to take people from Camp Ashraf who have shown that they are able to build communities, keep the peace, and reject terrorism, even in the face of the worst provocations committed by the Iraqis and intended to be committed by the Iranians. So timing is imperative. We have to urge the State Department to do the right thing now, now, today, not six months from now, not 60 days from now. As I've said before from podiums like this one, those of us who devote our lives to human rights often have to come in after the tragedy has occurred, after the humanitarian disasters have been completed. And our job is to make sure that we bring the perpetrators to justice. We have an opportunity today to save lives, to prevent. Can you imagine what it would feel like for every one of us in this room and for everyone in the United States of America if because of the delay, if because of the needless politically motivated delay, diplomatically motivated delay, lives are taken. And when certainty is on one side of the equation and risk is on the other side of the equation, common sense requires that we follow the least risky path and we follow the path that we promised. The Constitution says the United States must comply with its contracts. We have a contract. I've said this before and it bears repeating. Elie Wiesel, who represents the failure of the world to stop the killing of innocent people. He, one of the few survivors, he says for him, the greatest lesson of the Holocaust has always been, believe the threats of your enemies more than you believe the promises of your friends. We know the threats of the Iranians and the Iraqis are serious. Now it's time for the United States to keep its promise to keep it now. The Constitution of the United States demands no less. Our commitment to liberty and justice commands no less. Our obligation to save life demands no less. The United States government must act and it must act now. Thank you very much.